For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? Today is National Football Day. It's National Bank Transfer Day. It's National Bison Day. But today we celebrate National Book Lovers Day. I am an amazing book lover. I mean, if you were to see the periphery of my office right now, I don't have enough bookshelves. I have books piled up on my desk. I have them in corners. I have them everywhere. I am surrounded by books. Even as a little boy growing up in Conway, South Carolina, if anyone ever asked my parents what I would want for my birthday or what I would want uh, for any of the holidays, uh, the answer was always, give them a book because he, I was a bookworm, I was a book nerd. I had a great mentor, I've talked about her before. And before I bring on our first guest, I've got five amazing authors waiting in the wings and we're gonna talk about the world of writing and books and everything and their love of books. But I had this great mentor, Florence Theodora Epps in Conway, South Carolina. I used to go to her home every Wednesday and Thursday afternoon for elocution lessons and for history lessons in the theater. She was my mentor and we would read from the classics. We would read from biographies. We would read from everything. And if I came across a name, uh, she would ask me about that person. And if I didn't know who they were, she would close the book and she would say, go home and learn about this person and come back next week. And she instilled in me the importance of knowledge and getting to know these people. And it's very important that I, I to this day, I still carry that around. Uh, this was before Google. I would go to the Conway Library and uh, Catherine Lewis, our head librarian, she would see me walk in the door and she would take me over to all the new biographies that came out because in the mid seventies, because of films like That's Entertainment coming out, a nostalgia craze took over the entire country and a lot of biographies, a lot of autobiographies came out. So it was very easy for me to get that information that I needed. But today we are going to be celebrating uh, well, four of our guests uh, have celebrated great artists, and one of our artists, uh, one of our artists, one of our authors today is a book author, and I love them all, and I am so thrilled. I'm going to begin by bringing on Laura Gabrielle. Laura was on the show just a few weeks ago. Uh, we were celebrating her amazing book, Marion Davies. And I love the synchronicity of all this because two nights later, I am watching a PBS special on uh, W.H. Hearst. And there is Laura right there in the middle. Of, but you hear her voice before you see her. And I said, that sounds like Laura. <laughs> and the, sure, sure enough, you were there. So first of all, I want to thank you for being here. As I said, your book about Marion Davies, which I highly recommend to everybody, is just amazing. And we talked when you were on the show before uh, about how you got started with this. So everyone go and look at that show. It's archived. But I want to start with, since you and I've spoken, how has the impact of this book changed your life? It's been pretty remarkable. Uh, the The reception has been, has been just beyond fantastic. And... And I've, I've been on lots of podcasts and lots of shows, and it's, it's just been a lot of fun. Actually, this coming Wednesday, I'm going to be on a show called All to Live, which is uh, the sort of um, video cast version of uh, All to Journal, which is, which is owned and operated by William Randolph Hearst III. Wow. So Will, Will Three and I are going to be talking um, together about Marion Davies and about his grandfather and about their relationship and how the reality of it differs from what he was told. And, and it's, it's, I think it's going to be pretty fascinating. 
So by all means, please send me the link so that I can get this out to our viewers and sure. everyone. So I want to ask you, where did your love of books begin? Well, I've always, always loved books from the time that I was. <laughs> my mom, my mom uh, jokes that people would would make fun of her when I was a newborn because she would be reading books to me when, when, you know, I was just, just barely out of the womb. And uh, I learned to read quite early because I just loved books so much. Uh, and so I, I can't even, I can't even say when my love of books began because it, it's always been there. So I want to ask you, what was, what is the biggest surprise that has come to you? Um, correct me if I'm wrong. This is your first book. This is my first book. So what is the biggest surprise that has come out of all this for you in terms of this world of book writing and uh, and the aftermath of writing a book? The biggest surprise, I would say, for me is how how many how many stages there are. Uh, I've I felt like at the at the very beginning. I was doing the research and then there was a long stage when I was just researching for years and years. Then there was the stage of writing and then there's the stage of getting it published. And then there's the stage of post publication. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and they're all distinct phases of the process. And that, that surprised me a little bit because I thought that they would, they would maybe flow together more than they do. Uh, but they're, uh, I'm, I'm now, it's almost like a different language. You know, you have to, you have to speak the language of post-production when you're in, when you're in post-production in, in the language of publicity, when you're, when you're uh, getting the book out there. So just, just the process is, is, is different than, than what I expected. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, it's just different. Well, here is the book everyone and it is incredible captain of her soul uh the life of marianne davies and i learned so much about her uh from you so i want to thank you uh for uh taking the time to write this i have put out uh i have these uh question cards and i put out five random cards i haven't even looked at them uh and i'm going to see if i can tie it into a book related question once you pull so pull the number one through five and let's see what your question is okay Let's do number four. Number four. And the question is, um, well, this is a good one. Make sure someone gets the credit they deserve. Oh. So today, let's make sure that someone gets the credit they deserve that helped you in the process of this book. Yes. Well, that is, that that's a great one because it actually ties into, I was thinking about who my favorite authors were. And a lot of my favorite authors are people who helped me either through their books or through their actual participation in, in getting the book out. Um, so I would like to I would like to specifically mention Carrie Beecham, who wrote a book called Without Lying Down, uh, Francis Marion and the Powerful Women of Early Hollywood. It's the seminal book on uh, women in early Hollywood. And she has become a mentor and a good friend. And she helped me in so many different parts of this uh, process. And um, from, from her style of writing, even before we met, to uh, helping shape phrases and, 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 and things like, like that. It's, it was really, really remarkable. Um, and so she, I think, is somebody who both fits into my favorite authors category and fits into somebody to whom I owe a great debt of gratitude. That's great. Uh, so uh, I know that you're going to have to leave early, but I hope that you'll stick around for a little bit. Yes. And you get to bring on our next guest. So uh, we've got four doors, like let's make a deal. One great. through four, pull up our next guest. Let's do door number two. And that is, I'm going to bring up his book so he'll know who's about to come up here. Uh, and uh, this, I, I, I love this man so much. He's been on the show twice. And we've, uh, we've never met in person, but we've had some very deep conversations. Do you know who I'm talking about? It's Lon Davis. 
and Ma and Pa Kettle on film. So Lon, meet Laura, and both Hi, of Laura. You. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank nice very to see good. You. I'm a huge well, Marion Davies fan, by the way. Oh, good. Yes, you so I'm looking very much forward to reading your book. Oh, I'm so it glad. It's amazing. Amazing, amazing book. Very different ma from Ma and Pa Kettle. I should say. <laughs> Although she did have the comic chops, she could have yes. been right there in the middle of all of this. Uh, mm -hmm. Something that a lot of people don't really realize about her so, so much. Um, I am going to step off with you, Lon. First of all, welcome back to the show. Thank um, you. And you have written a lot of books, and all of your books are all in the realm of classic Hollywood, uh, you know, and uh, what is it about classic Hollywood that draws you in? It's been my passion and obsession since I was about five years old. Mm -hmm. I think it started because of film collecting. I was a, a I collected eight millimeter films that were available and uh, they featured Chaplin and the Keystone Cops and things like that. And it just, it hooked me very early on. And later it became very personal to me as I began to meet the survivors of that era, of the silent film era and the early talkies and vaudeville. I sought out people in every form of media and uh, every type of entertainment to learn from the, from the masters, you might say. And that is where my love really began. You, um, Carol Channing once said, writing a book is a solitary profession. Um, but I disagree with that because yeah. it truly is a collaborative process. Uh, I wanna sp speak specifically about Mom Pa Kettle because that's the sh uh, show that you and I really delved into. Uh, having you on this show. What was it about their films and that franchise, because it truly was a franchise, that pulled you in to wanting to devote your time and energy because it really is a huge commitment to write a book? It, so, it is. Yes. Well, I, I think it was, well, the humor was unmistakable. I, you have two brilliant comic actors in the lead. Percy Kilbride and Marjorie Maine, and they simply knocked every line out of the park, so to speak. They were so perfect in those roles. In fact, it's what people thought, people watching them thought that's who they are. And to some extent, they were quite a bit like their actual characters, but they were also classically trained um, Shakespearean actors who had a wide variety of roles on the stage and in film. So it it really is, I guess that would have to be the reason the the people themselves, the situations of course were corny and it, rural kind of humor, but to a kid that was, it was cutting edge and I would enjoy watching <laughs> just them. Adult. Every, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and I just enjoyed, I just enjoyed their films. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, um, they were great, and they've, those memories have stayed with me all these many years. That's great. I'm going to uh, step off of the question that I asked Laura. Now's your chance to really thank the people who have helped you on your path to the books that you've written. So, Oh, yes. I have been very fortunate. Like Laura, um, I befriended um, several people in who were film historians that I have great respect for especially Kevin Brownlow. Uh, he is, is, Laura's nodding. He's, he's the gold standard of film history. And he has concentrated exclusively on the silent era, although he did do a book on David Lean, come to think of it. But primarily, it's been reviving the silent film era, restoring films, writing marvelous books like The Parade's Gone By and many others. Uh, Leonard Malton, has also been a great inspiration to me and a great help. Uh, gosh, there are several people. Um, I just have been, Steve Cox is a guy who's a wonderful author. He has done many books on popular culture. He's helped me out with photographs. And so has Mark Wanamaker, who is 
another one. I'm sure Laura is familiar with him. It is a, it is incredible how generous these people have been. I reach out to them as a stranger and I became their friend and they were very open to that. And indeed, you cannot do a book alone. You are definitely in the, you, you definitely owe so much to those individuals who came before you. And yeah, I'm sure like in Laura's case, um, Gavin Lambert, didn't he do a book on Marion Davies? And there are other people when sometimes if you're lucky enough to find a person who hasn't been um, exploited, you know, in terms of their life story, it's very rare because every corner of show business literature seems to have been dusted pretty thoroughly. And I have been lucky enough to do a couple of books on some, well, for example, the Mon Paul Kettle book, no book had ever been written on that series before, which I, which surprised me. The Keystone Cops, uh, we did a book on them called Chase. And that was the first book dedicated to that seminal uh, comedy team of the silent era. Also our particular favorite, Francis X. Bushman, a great, great silent film star. And uh, we wrote uh, his authorized biography, King of the Movies. And we also did a documentary uh, film on him, oh, which yeah. is shown periodically on TCM. Mm -hmm. So I'm, like I said, we were lucky in, in some respects that we made certain contacts and that people like Mrs. Bushman, or as I mentioned, Mr. Brownlow or Anthony Slide, they were available, helpful, and I will always be grateful for them. It's not just a mention in the acknowledgement section of a book. It's a genuine heartfelt feeling. That's wonderful. So you get to pick your mystery question as well. Uh, it won okay. three four. Oh, let's go with three. Okay. And the question is, and I'm going to try to tie it. Uh, why, uh, I'm, well, what was your first book? Uh, not that your first book that you wrote, but your first book that you remember reading as a child. Probably Curious George. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I was only in my th uh, early 30s at the time. Oh, and... same year, same year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually, um, you know, who really had an inspiration, who was an inspiration for me was Captain Kangaroo. Uh yeah, if you, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember that program. You probably aren't. But back in the early 60s, I watched him faithfully. And he would do this thing where he would um, read a book and they would show the pictures. And that got me, that drew me in very much. And probably seeing, you know, Curious George on Captain Kangaroo made me think when I was in school, order um they used to have these things where the nuns at, i went to a catholic school where the nuns would say you can order any books you want off of these lists and so you would check them and think i want this and this and then there came this marvelous day when a fresh box of beautiful brand new shiny books arrived and i was so glad i had placed an order for those and you you, they were sometimes like novels aimed at children or uh, various other things. It was just, it was incredible. A book becomes a magical item when you love them. They really, they're, my mother, my dear mother-in-law who's passed, once said that her books were her friends. Yes. Of course, she, she had a hard time making friends with real people, but um, not really. She was a delight and she enjoyed uh, reading so much. And I used to read to her. And when she was ill toward the end of her life, I, I read her to sleep many times. That was one thing that really relaxed her. So reading is, is everything. Any writer worth his salt or her salt reads and reads and reads other authors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very important. Well, it's not every day that Captain Kangaroo is mentioned on yeah. uh, our show, So, but I'm going to share this, if you can all see this. This is, oh. this is Captain Kangaroo with my dear friend Carol Channing. She signed this. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Uh, and this is one of my prized possessions. I can imagine. Yeah. Who's the dog in the middle? Uh, I don't know who the dog is in the middle, but uh, it may have been her, her husband. You know? <laughs> yeah. She referred to him as a dog. So uh... <laughs> you, you got you got Carol Channing and Captain Kangaroo, two icons in the same right, picture. Right there. It's yes. Wonderful. So, you are going to bring on our next guest, just like let's make a deal, door number one, door number two, or door number three. Well, Richard, I really think I've given this a lot of thought, and I think we should go with door number one. Okay, and I am so, well, she was on the show a few weeks ago, and uh, in this incredible book, she knows who's coming on, uh, celebrating Robert Preston. Oh, Another. Yes phenomenal book by the way everyone all of these shows are archived on my richard skipper celebrates show please check them out and order these books uh but that night i felt something coming over me uh and by the end of the show i discovered that i had covid so oh, i am no. glad that she's back and <laughs> i feel wonderful deborah i am so thrilled that you were here Meet Laura Gabrielle and Lon Davis. Hi, and I'm thrilled to be back too. I'm, I'm glad you're feeling better. I am feeling wonderful, but it knocked me out. For two years, I'll share this with everyone very quickly. Um, Helen Hayes, I live uh, just below Nyack, and Helen Hayes was a major fixture here. And we just had her home dedicated as a literary landmark, important to notice uh, on this day of book lovers, because she wrote her books at Pretty Penny. Her home was called Pretty Penny because when asked, what did this place cost you? She said a pretty penny. So it is still called Pretty Penny to this day. Um, she, of course, uh, you know, was uh, married to Charles MacArthur, who wrote the front page there. Uh, he wrote the screenplay for Wuthering Heights and so many other uh, oh, yeah. literary uh, masterpieces were written in that home. Um, for two years, I worked on this project and I was not able to go to any of the events. So, uh, and it all began with you, Deborah. <laughs> so first of all, you, this book, as you know, I love, love, love this book. How has this book changed your life? Uh, and uh, what is your schedule like right now? Um, well, since I was on your show, uh, there's been several podcasts and radio shows, and I have a few more. Um, coming up regarding the book. So that's kind of down the pike. Um, and just the whole process of writing the book uh, was, I, I want to say it restored my faith in human nature. You know, I wrote it during the height of the pandemic. And um, just everyone that I contacted, whether it was a celebrity interviews that I did or um, having to reach out to all of these reference librarians, because of course I couldn't be going anywhere during the pandemic, um, who just went above and beyond the call of duty to get you know various either articles that I needed or other reference material. Um, it just kind of restored my faith in, in human nature. Uh, I know that's their job, but they kind of you know bent over backwards to get me all the information in a timely manner. So. Um, in the dark days of the pandemic, uh, the book really kind of researching the book and, and writing the book really restored my faith in, in human nature. So uh, that, that was kind of a side benefit for doing all of this. What was the biggest surprise for you or the biggest aha moment for you writing this book? Um, I guess the biggest surprise was that, you know, one of the reasons I delved into this and wrote it in the first place is because um, everywhere you looked, whether it was on websites, articles, et cetera, they always talked about Preston being uh, extremely private and there was nothing about his life out there, et cetera, et cetera. And, so, <laughs> and yeah. so I, and so I um, it kind of took that as a challenge and said, well, let me see what I can find out. And interestingly, there's a lot, to, there was a lot to, be easily found. So uh, I'm surprised <laughs> that no one pursued it. I mean, there was a lot, it took a lot of digging, a lot of interviews, um, you know, getting a lot of information. But if you, if someone is, you know, dedicated to doing that, as you can see, I, you know, 
put everything in this in the in the text, uh, it, it, it's possible it was possible to find out. So th that's kind of what surprised me is that, um, and of course this is like 35 years after his death. But I'm I'm surprised that closer to his death in 1987 that someone didn't undertake this project and and write write it sooner. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what what shocked me is that if you know th there were all these breadcrumbs that he kind of left. Um, and, uh, if you, if you followed the trail, you'd be able to find that information about his life. So I'm going to go back for you as well. Do you remember your first book as a child? Um, probably not the title. I remember, you know, I'm going to date myself here, but, uh, we had all these little golden books, you know, and so I was uh, and sort of like you, uh, people would ask, oh, what does she want for her birthday or for Christmas or whatever? It was always a book. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember having a huge library of all these little books and reading them constantly, having my mother, you know, people read them to me constantly. And then, you know, as, as I got older, um, I kind of... Uh, I don't, I don't want to say on the sneak, but I would go up to the, we had a corner drugstore and they had all of these, I don't want to say adult type books, but I was maybe um, in junior high school and I would read like Sybil or The Godfather or things that maybe I shouldn't have read till, you know, I was a little bit older, but I was fascinated by, you know, so I would get these books and I would read them. And in fact, the whole Sybil, um, reading Sybil, I must've been maybe 11 or 12 or whatever, um, it just fascinated me so much, and that's I, I kind of propelled me into my my career as a mental health professional because I, I just found that so fascinating. Wow. Um, her whole story, and and in fact, I did have in my practice a, one multiple that I dealt with, so that that was very interesting. But um, so you know, I I started reading, like I said, from an early age, read various books, but for me. Um, my favorite genre is um, biography or memoir mm -hmm. um, because, uh, and, and, and the two guests that you have on here obviously have written a lot about their memoir uh, biography type books, only because I find that, although, uh, you know, fiction is great, I'm not negating that in any way, but I find that people, real people's lives are far more fascinating than anything you could concoct in your head. And again, I found that true, you know, it, when I was working as a therapist, sometimes people would come in and tell me the story, their story or their family, and I would have to really hold it together to keep my jaw from dropping because I would hear different things that were going on uh, or that went on in their family and I'd be in my mind going, oh my gosh. Uh, so. You know, I saw that firsthand from dealing with people and families. And the same thing is true, obviously, with people who write biographies or people who write their own autobiographies or memoirs. F fascinating. Um, the, the various trials and tribulations and things that, that they had to deal with in their life. So for me, that's my preferred genre of book. Although I do appreciate other things, um, that for me is the favorite. I totally agree with everything you just said. And it's interesting that you talk about reading Sybil at that at early age. My mom found Valley of the Dolls under my pillow. I had no <laughs> idea. I had no idea what I was reading about, but I think that affected <laughs> my life as well. So, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, now, Deborah, I want to ask, as I've asked both Laura and Lon, um, now's your chance to really thank the people who have helped you on your path with uh, especially this uh, book with um, Robert Preston? Um, well, I think I have to thank a lot of people on a lot of different levels. Um, you know, first of all, my family for being so supportive, I would, you know, kind of have to cocoon myself to do all this research and writing. And so um, there were a lot of the times I was, you know, absent, literally and, and figuratively. Um, and so I have to obviously thank them for all their support. But as I mentioned before, um, I really have to thank thank uh, the reference librarians um, uh, all across the country um, who uh, were so gracious and kind and magnanimous and, you know, helped me collect all this information. And then also um, many of the celebrities, Rosemary Harris, Christopher Walken, Leslie Ann Warren, Bob Gunton, Neva Small, I can go on and on, all the people that I interviewed, 
um, they immediately, when I mentioned I was doing uh, a biography of Robert Preston, without hesitation, said, absolutely, uh, we'll, you know, we're, we're happy to uh, speak to you and we're happy somebody's finally doing this, et cetera. Um, and so they were willing to share their precious memories, their um, anecdotes, and uh, that was great. And then also, because, you know, this is my first time, uh, well, I've written other local area history books, but this is the first, you know, biography that I've written. And um, I have to thank, I mean, there was two people in particular, Ron Spivak yes. um, and um, Paul Brown, who wrote uh, a book about um, uh, James Aggie, who um, uh, the, the movie All the Way Home was based on in the play. Um, kind of sight unseen, um, they went out of their way. They gave me reference materials, extensive re reference materials, and wrote blurbs for my book that were just phenomenal. So, um, you know, so many people have just been um, so forthcoming, so generous that uh, I can't thank them all enough. So, and some of them are, like I said, the librarians that are unseen faces. Uh, New York Public Library was especially helpful, and also Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, just fantastic. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without all their help. That's great. So you get to pull a question, one through three. Uh, number two. And the question is, um, well, choose. I, I'm, uh, it says choose a new skill that you'd like to master and investigate your options on learning it. I'm going to rephrase this since we're fo focused on books today. Um, who is someone that you would really like to delve into as your next subject? I, I think I've discussed this, uh, yes. discussed this on your last show. Hands down, Christopher Walken. Yes. Um, I had extensive uh, three different conversations with him. Um, he just is, you know, uh, so interesting. Um, he had so many more stories to tell than what I put in the book. Some of them, you know, he digressed about his own career, et cetera. Um, and I and I realized why that probably won't happen. Um, but uh, certainly he was full of stories. Um, he's, you know, his career itself is very interesting. So that would be somebody, uh, someone that I would really uh, love to be able to delve into his life and his career and what what makes him tick. Um, that reminds me of a question I want to ask each of you before I bring on our next guest. Um, all of you have written about people that are no longer with us. Um, would any of you be interested in writing, Deborah, you've already uh, touched upon this, uh, right? Uh, obviously, you would, if you wrote a book, I'm assuming, on Christopher Walken, you would desire that it be an authorized biography. Sure. Um, have the either, uh, either you, Laura, or Lon thought about a contemporary artist or someone who's still with us that you would like to write about? Um. It, for me, it's uh, I could answer this question, then I'm going to have to go because I have a I have another appointment. But this has been wonderful. No, thank you for um, being Yeah, for for me, I think that it would be very much a different process uh, because uh, you would have to go to people who are living. You'd have to, you know, get get uh, you know, you'd have to. Um, I I think that the the uh how do i want to say this uh like when you when you write about someone who's living there are all kinds of um personalities to deal with all kinds of uh you know other um you know, somebody might might talk to somebody else and say, oh, you should really talk to this person. And then this person says, no, you shouldn't talk to this person. Anyway, there's like a, there's there's some uh, some potential drama there, uh, which which might make it a, a little bit more difficult. Um, it would be really interesting. And I would have to think about how to do that uh, if I were to do somebody uh, living. And I'm sure that it would be possible. It would just be a different approach. So. 
with that, I'm going to have to leave. Deborah, I'm going to say goodbye. You have Love another book event you. that you're off to. So thank you for being here today. Yes, thank and you, Richard. I'll take you out of the studio so you don't have to do anything. Okay, thank and, you. And uh, thank you for being here today. Yes, of Thanks. course. Take care, Laura. So, Lon, same question. Well, I have, as an editor, I've worked with various, a few celebrities on their memoir. For example, Gary Berghoff from MASH, you know? Yeah. I think he played Radar on that show. Yeah, that's uh, right. I worked with him and he was very concerned that I was going to in any way make any changes, but I had to because of editorial purposes. I mean, grammar and and people, unless you're a writer with a lot of experience, everybody needs an editor, whether you do or or whether you are a longtime writer or a new one. This was his first book, and he did a very good job describing his life and career. But it is a very different situation because there is very little. I, I prefer biographies to memoirs simply because biographies tend to be um, more uh, objective mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, a person, actors are known for their incredible egos mm -hmm. and it usually is very, very focused and they're, they're often defensive. I, I'm not generalizing about people like who are in show business. I just mean that they have a lot riding on telling their story and they want to make sure it's done in a way that reflects most positively on them. And so it's not really the same kind of journalism as researching a person's life and doing it. Also, I would be hard pressed to find a person who's alive today that I'd be that interested in because my interests are so antiquarian. Oh, know? come on, Ron. you and I have already talked about my book. <laughs> oh, well, no, that's different. That's different. Now, you know, I'm joking, I'm joking, don't, of <laughs> I'd love to work with you, Richard, but you're oh, one God. of the, but you also represent to me an, an earlier, better era in show business, well, um, you your influences that. and your experiences, but don't let me get off the topic. I, um, yes, there are some people I would love to work with. Richard Thank Skipper you. being one of them. Yeah. Thank you. Deborah, I'm going to let you bring on our next guest. Uh, okay. One or two. One or two. <laughs> two. Okay. We're going to shift gears from show business right now. Uh, I've talked to all of you about your first books. Well, look at this. This one, the number one, Durful, the one stop adopt shop. My Angel Watches Over Me, The Whole Story, H-O-L-E, Miranda the Panda, Mrs. Libra and Zoe Zebra, and my favorite, Moonbeam. <laughs> and I, you know, you don't think I still read children's books? I do. So you talk about Curious George uh, at 30, uh, yeah. Ruth Darling at 62 almost. And I'm going to bring her on. Ruthie, darling, I'm so glad you are here. Oh, Richard, I am thrilled to be on the show. So I will tell everyone, Ruthie reached out to me um, a couple of years ago. Another, uh, speaking of biographies, uh, there's an incredible book out about Joey Lansing. Uh, if you knew the actress, she was a, a glamour queen in Hollywood. Um, she... Uh, everything was about her looks. Uh, she had uh, breast augmentation and she got breast cancer uh, from this and eventually passed on. Uh, her partner wrote an incredible book about this. And as a result of that interview, um, Ruthie, I don't know if you you know, uh, were friends with Rachel or how you found it, but you reached out to me. You came on the show when you were just really starting to write. And now all these incredible books have been written since it's been two years since you and I sat down and talked. So congratulations on everything. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you, what was your first children's book? Uh, that, uh, not that you wrote, that you remember reading as a child. Well, the first one 
that I really that really stuck in my mind, besides you know the little books that children would read, were the Nancy Drew stories. I love the page turners. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I just it, it, it just sort of stayed with me. Now I have I mean all of your your whole genre has been on children's books. Uh, have you ever thought of delving into other uh, uh, genres or different types of books? You know, when I see, I have some friends out here who, <clears throat> excuse me, who are also authors. And I've said to them, I don't know how they, I couldn't do it. If somebody approached me and said, I'll give you a million dollars or I'll give you a gazillion dollars, I'd have to turn them down. I mean, this is just, this is just my thing. People tell me that I even talk in rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the books are written in rhyme, you know, so it, they're incredible books. Um, as I've asked both Juan and Deborah, this is a great opportunity for you now today uh, to thank the people who have been very instrumental on your path to getting you to where you are now in terms of these incredible books that you're writing. Well, I'll tell you, my children have been very supportive with this. When I started doing this, I started doing this like 42, 43 years ago, never thinking that I'd ever have an actual book to hold. And I just kept on with it. And there were a couple of people that were instrumental in getting me out there. Uh, one lady at the beauty shop heard me reading something off of a piece of paper. And I had printed off my computer. And she said, I can get you into the Children's Discovery Museum, which is in Rancho Mirage, California. So I, she, I had an audition there and they said, fine, I could come over and read. I didn't have any book. All I had were the copies from the hard drive. I had, you know, those moving cartons when people put, they put clothes in there and they transfer them from one place to another. I had a carton that ended up being filled with so many toys because I needed to have something to go with the stories. I didn't have any illustrations. And even though I can do a lot in art, I cannot do cartooning. She got me in there. Her name is Lynn Nobles. And to this day, I thank her for this because of the support. And what I had then I thought was I thought was pretty good, but but again, you know what? I was able to polish the stories up. I even had my first story. The whole story was on flannel board, and you know what? Children tell the truth, so they have been a, a mainstay of my support. If they don't like something, they don't mince any words. I mean, you know right away, and as a result coming fast forward to what I have now, I've had stories coming back to me where one four-year-old little boy would not go to sleep at night unless he put the book under his pillow. And I mean, and this just feeds my soul. I just, I thrive on this. It's, it's, it's food for my soul. It is, it's a God-given gift because I didn't write when I was in school Somebody had heard this. They said, what do you mean she's writing? She never wrote. <laughs> and I, I didn't. I, I wrote a junior term paper because I couldn't become a senior unless I turned in a junior term paper. In college, I wrote two and a half papers. And somebody helped me write the other half of the third. That was it. So this just, I can't even explain how this came to me. It's Again, it's a God-given gift. And when I see the reaction from the kids... And also adults, too. I mean, I've had adults buy these books for themselves. I didn't know that there were adult collectors of children's books. These have just reached, they've gone worldwide. And that was because Tony Robbins used to come out here. And I was in several hotel gift shops. And so people that were attending his meetings would come in. So they ended up going as far south as Australia and you know what? I mean, it's just the impetus. It's just one thing has just led to another, another and another and another. And if you ever thought or if I ever thought that I would have books, I would have said, you know what? It's, it's impossible. But but again, I have a thing. 
when you believe anything is possible. And I have I have a motto. I, I know I've said this to you before, but I'll share it again anyway. My motto, passion, is empowering children and adults through the wonderful world of children's literature. That took me over nine years to complete that sentence. It started out with children. Then I added adults when I saw that it was impacting adults in different ways. And then I added wonderful. Nine years plus. I love what I do and I do what I love. It's as simple as that. It. I love that. So you get to pick your mystery question and it's either one or two. Mm, I'll take uh, two. Okay. And the question is, um, who, I, I'm gonna, who was your first love and when? And I'm gonna make this about books. The first, I mean, you talked about the Nancy Drew books. You fell in love with these books. About how old were you when you fell in love with these books? And was it the mystery of the books that compelled you with these books? You know, that's an interesting question because I, I haven't thought about this in so long. But I guess I loved wanting to know what was on the next page. So I needed something that was a page turner for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that reflects upon what it is I'm doing now, because one thing has to segue into another. I just like the excitement of it. And I can't tell you what the first book was, but I'll tell you what stands out in my mind when you say, when I say page turner to you, I stumbled across a book when super crown books was in business. Mm. I was in the literature section and I see this big book, called the Quincunx, Q-U-I-N-C-U-N-X. I had never heard of it. The author was an Englishman named Charles Palliser. This book must have been close to a 1,000 pages long. I picked it up, and it got me from the very first sentence. It really hooked me in. And at one point in time, I turned the page so fast, I almost tore it. It's just, that's just my thing. <laughs> Well, I am going to bring on our next guest who's been waiting patiently in the wings and talk about pa uh, page turners. I mean, first of all, uh, the first book, uh, was that a name I dropped? <laughs> uh, and it begins with his pin pal association with Doris Day. I will say he tried so hard over the years to get me an interview with Doris. It never happened, but you tried. And, uh, and I was on her radar, so that means something. And then I love the title of this book, A Sprinkling of Stardust Over the Outhouse, which is his latest memoir. And you also have a book about the Concord Theater, uh, and uh, which I have not read yet. Uh, but Paul Brogan, welcome to the show. You've been here before. Um, I wanna ask you, um, this book, A Sprinkling of Stardust Over the Outhouse, I wanna go, uh, somewhere else with this, uh, with my question for you. And I hope you don't mind my going here. No, not at all. So Paul, and I, I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, Paul uh, was very candid in his book about certain relationships that he has known. And there are rabid fans out there, uh, and that's what I want to call them, who uh, I actually before Paul was going to come on the show, came after me. Why are you having him on the show? Because of these stories that he's telling in the book. As someone who's writing a memoir, as Lon referred to it a few months ago, you have a right to tell your story the way that you want to tell the story. Um, what do you say to those people out there who don't know intimately the people that you've known in your life and the choices that you choose in terms of the story that you choose to tell? Um, I can only say, uh, you know, this is my truth. This is what I experienced. And this is not the photo play magazine version or something else. And uh, I'm just saying what happened. And uh, I'm sorry if it offends or upsets you or you disagree, but you're certainly welcome to write your own book and I would encourage you to do that if you feel, you know, this does not represent how you feel someone should be represented publicly. 
Well, I think that with all of these artists, whether it be Mom Pa Kettle or Francis mm -hmm. X. Bushman or the Three Stooges or the Rat Pack uh, or Robert Preston, um, fans, there's a fans, mm -hmm. fanatics, uh, fandom, put these people on a pedestal to a point to where they, I think, somehow lose their humanness sometimes in the minds of the people who are their fans. Mm -hmm. And so when you are presenting these people as they truly are, uh, you, Paul and I, our initial introduction uh, is through Carol Channing. Uh, Carol is a very dear friend of mine. I've seen her without her makeup. I've seen her when she's angry. I've seen her when she's frustrated. I've seen her when she is being her authentic self mm -hmm. uh, out of the spotlight. And many people do not want to see that side or want to know about that side. So when you are writing a memoir, uh, it is your story to tell mm -hmm. and everyone's going to have their own version. Um, Kelly Ripa uh, was just, uh, you know, her recent book where she talks about her relationship with Richard mm -hmm. Tobin uh, was not a good relationship. And she's honest about it. And it is a, it is, has offended and upset other people who were part of his circle and his fears saying that that was not their experience. But she came along at a later time in his life. Mm -hmm. Well, we all, with anyone, we all have different interactions and experiences, even with just our friends. You know, one person may see us as one way and another totally different because of those interactions. Well, I want to go back and ask you, what is the first book that you remember reading as a child? I just happened to have it here. <laughs> um, this, wow. This was given to me for Christmas of 1957. Um, and it, it's a story for each day of the year. And um, my mother would read it and I would follow along the words to learn reading that way. Um, and uh, I still have the book and once in a while I'll pull it out on a particular date to read, you know, that story. And it just, there's a, a lovely security in still having it here 65 years later. And it just, uh, it was sh so short story, but you became mesmerized because it was about the people living on a particular street. So they became like friends to you. And uh, so that was, that was my first introduction. Secret Garden was the first one that was an actual book. I saw the movie on the early show on television. And my mother said, well, that's a book, you know. And so she went out and got it for me. Wow. And I was just, you know, hooked from then on. And again, now is your chance to thank the people who you would like to thank who have helped you to the where you are now in terms of the books that you've written. Well, first of all, my husband, Alan, because he's the one that said to me, you know, you've written plays, you've written screenplays that never got produced, but things that I, you know, sending them to Shelley Winters or Marlon Brando, and that was, they just went off into the ether. But uh, he said to me, um, you know, you really need to actually write a book. And he said, I can live with you during that process. So I was over 50 when I wrote the first book. Was that a name I dropped? And um, it was like a whole new, at the time I was working with HIV AIDS uh, individuals in the state uh, for an AIDS organization. And um, it was a wonderful way to get away from the fact that we were still losing so many people and every day at work could be so high stress to go and start to write this book and and to relive things that i had sort of pushed into the background so he's the first one second would be doris because she's the one that said to me decades ago paul you need to tell your story. She had written a book uh, with A.E. Hotchner that Doris Day, her own story that had been very successful. And I had praised it at the time. And she said, well, you have an amazing life and a fascinating life. And I said, but it's not like yours. She said, of course, it's not like yours, but that's okay. 
um, there will be lessons people will learn from what you've gone through and you need to share that and you might make a difference in the life of one person. So probably Alan for getting me to actually sit down and Doris for planting the seed a long time ago. That's great. Now, this is your, the last question here, and then I'm going to go around and ask each of you uh, specific questions. Um, what's the first book that you bought? The first book that I actually bought was a book called Good Times, Bad Times by James Kirkwood. Um, and I bought that in 1968, right after it came out. And I just loved it. I, I wrote him a fan letter about it. Um, this was long before he did Chorus Line and all of that. Uh, but I just loved it. And I uh, immediately turned it into a screenplay. It never saw the light of day, but um, I, I just loved it. And, and uh, it was $1.79. It wow. cost so I'm going to go around. I'm going to ask each of you um, as we wind down here. And again, thank you all for being here. Uh, Lon, what are you currently reading? Currently reading? Actually, I'm currently reading uh, Penny Marshall's memoir. Uh, it's um, it's very funny. And uh, she, I think she passed away a few years ago. And what a talented woman she was. I don't know how I happened to start reading it. But I did, and it was it must have come up in my Kindle feed or something. But I just read book after book after book, like all of my co-panelists, I'm sure. But that was a uh, but she's really entertaining and very fun. Yeah. Uh, Deborah. Uh, the book that I'm currently reading now is called um, Lady in Waiting. It's by um, Anne Glenn Connor. And I was got interested in this book after Queen Elizabeth passed and the whole emphasis on royalty. And this lady was a lady in waiting to Princess Margaret, actually. And uh, her life story, you know, as I mentioned before with biographies, is just so crazy. I mean, um, <laughs> she talks about here about her, how her husband, they went, when she got married, they went uh, to Paris. And the first thing he did was bring her up into this shabby apartment um, and, and force her to watch two people having sex so she would, quote, know what to do, you know. Um, so <laughs> there are all these wild Jeez. stories in this book um, of her life and things that happened to her. And again, that's why I always say um, real life is uh, much more fascinating than fiction. So this is the um, book that I'm reading, and it's because of the, in the aftermath of the death of Queen Elizabeth. Wow. Ruthie? The Alchemist. But before I talk about The Alchemist, I have to say one more thing about who is supporting what it is I'm doing, and that is my brilliant illustrator, Adam Devaney. So let, thank you for letting me put that in. I, I, would, I, I, would, I would greatly regret not having mentioned him because he's made these happen. He's Look made them come to life. Are. And all of her books are like this. Gorgeous, gorgeous books. And the holidays are coming up, folks. Give children books. You know, it can open a whole world for them. Uh, Paul, what are you currently reading? I'm reading a book by by a local author, Margaret Porter, called The Myrtle Wand. But she's received international acclaim for her writing, set in the 1600s. Um, it uh, has a connection to the ballet Giselle. Uh, it's romantic, mystical. Um, I don't want to give away too much because it really is a special story and I'm having a hard time putting it down long enough to come on your show, but <laughs> I would not miss an opportunity to join you and your guests, but it's a wonderful book called The Myrtle Wand. Wow. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, I'm going to say my closing remarks and then uh, Lon, I'm going to turn it over to you and then you can pick the next person and so on. And the last person standing, when you say goodbye, the credits will roll so you don't have to worry about how we're going to end the show today. Uh, but I just want to thank you all for being here. Uh, as I said at the beginning of today's show, uh, books, books, books. Um, I love them. Um, one thing that will, uh, and those of you who have been on the show, you know I'm telling the truth. When I have a guest on this show who has written a book, I read the book. I interviewed someone the other night and he says, how do you know all this? And I said, it's in your book. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I love to read. I'm an insatiable reader. 
Um, I just, I, I, I don't, believe it or not, I don't drive. My husband drives when I'm in the car and reading anything I can do to read a book, get it out there. Uh, and I love giving away books. I love sharing books. All of these authors, these books are incredible. Everybody, my hope is that you will take the time to go back. I actually have a playlist and you're all on that playlist of authors who have, uh, you know, have been on the show. Uh, go check out not only these authors, but other authors. I end every show, uh, first of all, thanking everyone for being here. If this is your first time here, I hope it will not be your last. Uh, please, please, please uh, leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, let me know your thoughts about today's show and other shows that I've done as well. Uh, share this with your friends. Advertising is great. And this is true. Everyone on the panel will agree with me. But word of mouth is even greater. Uh, if you've read these books, it, you know, tell other people about them. Get the word out. Uh, and it just takes, uh, you know, just a moment to tell someone that you read a great book. You saw a great movie. Um, just don't let it stop with you. Keep the momentum going. I end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your database, your address book, whatever you call it these days, and find somebody that you haven't spoken to in the last nine weeks and reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, but a phone call. I've said this on several of the shows this week. Um, last week, I lost three friends. Last night, a birthday reminder came up and I went to send this lady a, a thank you, I mean, a, a happy birthday, mm -hmm. only to find out that she had passed away six months ago and I didn't even know it. Uh, so it's important that we take the time to reach out and let those in our lives know what they mean to us instead of making a celebration about who they were and are after they've gone. So please take the time to do so. Um, I have a dear friend, Sean Moniger. He always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're gonna be in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along and a good book. So I'm going to leave on that note today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you, Lon. And when you finish, you'll pick the next person for their closing remarks. And again, it can be about anything that we talked about, anything we didn't talk about, or just any final message you wanna leave everyone with today. And again, thank you all for being here today. Lon, love you. It's all yours. Love you too, uh, Richard. You are just great. And I think it's wonderful that you're taking the time to honor books and the absolute joy that they certainly bring all of us and Everyone who's ever lost themselves in a book knows what a glorious experience it is. And now I would like to turn this over to, um, and perhaps I'm chosen her because of her name. My wife's name is Deborah, and it's spelled the same way. So for Deborah Warren, uh, please take it from here. Thank you so much. Um, just following up on the whole topic of today's show, National Book Day, um, I just want to encourage everyone to read, read, read. I don't care if it's fiction, nonfiction, um, self-help books, whatever. Um, reading uh, broadens your horizons, uh, broadens your mind, um, invigorates your brain, uh, provides joy, provides hope. Uh, and education. And uh, I think the world uh, would be a much, much better place if if everyone read more. So I encourage on this day, uh, people just to get out there, buy a book and start reading. Um, and I'm going to throw it over to Ruthie next. Richard, I want to thank you for having me on again. I, it's really an honor and a privilege. Uh, as you well know from having heard me before, I love what I do. I do what I love. The people that have supported me along the way, word of mouth, getting these books out, absolutely astounds me. And all I can say is, you know what, reading is just, it's just another avenue of, of life. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great escape and it's, it's entertaining and it's thrilling and it's, and it's, I remember reading Auntie Mame, the first, the first page I got to. I mean, I was laughing hysterically. And it, it just, you know what? It, it's just, it's a gift. And all of these people that you've had on, 
I really feel privileged to be on with. They're all in their own right, adding so much, giving so much to the world. It's just, I'm, I'm, you know me, I usually, I'm not without, I'm not speechless. I'm speechless. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And now I'll hand it over to Paul. Thank you so much. It's been great being here with these amazing people. Now I can add all of their names to my list of books to read. And of course, being here with Richard and celebrating is just a wonderful experience. He's a genuine icon who celebrates life and makes it better. As for reading, uh, grab a book, go to the library, go to any place and get a book and lose yourself away from the world of politics, the world of stress, the stock market, inflation, everything else. For an hour or two a day, let yourself escape and be free and it will make life better. You'll sleep better and you'll have a much happier attitude about life. So thank you all. And I look forward to seeing you sometime again soon. Thank you, Richard. Love you.